we have a panel of journalists who is too shy to walk on the stage. I'm not quite sure what that means. <laughs> I'm introducing our moderator, Roop Raj, as a television journalist here in Detroit on Fox. He's someone who is uh, really, really versed in the issues of the zoo. He covers the zoo a lot. Um, the other panelists, Roop, will introduce to you. We are really thrilled about having this session. Um, we think this is an incredibly relevant thing for uh, this audience of zoo CEOs and aquarium CEOs uh, to be a part of, as with the others. Please, as you have questions, please write them down, pass them over, and we will get questions up to the panel. Thank you so much, Scott. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good. Welcome to Detroit. Welcome to Royal Oak. And, of course, as you already have been, welcome to the wonderful Detroit Zoo. It is such a pleasure to be here. You know, I make it here probably once a month, and I really do think I have one of the best jobs in Detroit because I get paid to come to the zoo once a month to feature what's happening at the zoo. And no, it's not just the, hey guys, we're coming to you from the sloth exhibit, isn't this great? It's more like, what are we doing to help animals right here in Metro Detroit? What are we doing to help animals across the world? That work that's being done in Metro Detroit, the conservation efforts here are incredible. And so it is so much fun to be back here. Uh, usually when you tell someone you're gonna go speak at a symposium, you think, <laughs> oh no, it's gonna be so boring. But I was so intrigued by everything that last speaker was talking about. This stuff really matters, and it matters to you, it matters to us, and it matters to the panelists who are sitting right in front of us right now. It is my distinct pleasure, my friends, to introduce to you Rachel Bale, a reporter for National Geographic. And to get the audience the blood flowing, and for them, put your hands together for them as we introduce them. Rachel Bale, <laughs> National Geographic. We have Karen Bruliard, staff writer and editor with The Washington Post. And as a native Detroiter and someone who's uh, been in the business for uh, about 20 years or so, wanted to work at Channel 2 during the time that... No. no, 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 no. I was working elsewhere in the business, but would watch closely Lucy Nolan as I'd come home to watch the news. And I loved Channel 2, and I'm so happy to be on the news there now. But Lucy, one of the most popular anchors that Detroit ever saw, and that is the truth. She is now in Philadelphia, our loss, their gain. She's the main anchor woman there at Fox 29 in Philadelphia. Put your hands together for Lucy Nolan. <laughs> Lucy, I mean, you laughed, but you still love Detroit. Uh, of course. No, I can tell. I, you I, flew I, in. 100%, 100%, and I've been everywhere. You know, I mean, truly, it's a, you know, Alaska, um, California, Los Angeles, New York, Houston, Philadelphia, Detroit. And Detroit's always in my heart. And part of it is because of that man right there, Ron Kagan. Ron no, I'm, Kagan, I'm, ladies I'm and serious. gentlemen. Yeah. I'm no, serious. Right. I mean, my, my first uh, introduction into really animal welfare and why zoos do the things they do, at least Ron, the way he did it here, was because of him. My, my eyes were opened. I was ambivalent about zoos beforehand. And like you said, you know, what we get to do in, in TV anyhow is we have wide-ranging audiences, right? Yep. So our audiences tune in, especially in the morning, because they're brushing their teeth, they're putting on clothes, uh, they want to know about their sports, their weather, and a variety of um, news. And what we can do through the media um, if it's well-crafted and well-shaped, is explain complex things, you know, like that delicate balance between an individual animal and conservation. Sure. It, I mean, and, you know, if you just say those words to people at home, their eyes glaze over, they're on to the next channel, or they're, they're going through whatever media they've got in front of them. But if you explain it in an interesting, intriguing way that maybe individualized, you know, it's one animal, they go, oh, that's interesting. And now they're watching and you've opened up their eyes. Could you imagine if we were to be able to on the news and perhaps we'll do this when we come back on May 17th to do our next live shot at Fox 2, but to be able to use the words and, and as you mentioned, in a conversational way to be able to say something like, man, the way human beings feel about themselves affects the way animals are treated. And we know that across the world and we know that here at the zoo. Just that one sentence right there really kind of changes the dialogue and for the person making the breakfast at home, maybe they go, whoa, man, I really thought of it like that. Um, we're going to be talking to all of our panelists about that topic and a lot more. But let's begin with a little bit of a background of how each one of our individuals covers zoo issues, aquarium issues, really animal welfare issues. And uh, we'll begin right now with, with Rachel uh, with the National Geographic and give us kind of an umbrella view as a National Geographic. I mean, follow you guys on Twitter and I click on the links and read the articles so we have an idea of what you think and how you think. But give us an insider's view about how you cover zoos. So for me, I occupy a pretty 
unique space with the National Geographic that's been created in the last couple of years. I write for our series called Wildlife Watch, which originally started as a program that was focusing specifically on wildlife crime and exploitation. So for a long time, my beat was focused primarily on poaching and trafficking. But um, lately, it's really expanded to include other categories, including hunting, exotic pets, the live animal trade, and sometimes zoos. Our readers are super interested in animal welfare, and they're particularly interested in zoos. They rely on us as National Geographic reporters to not just tell them what's going on, but a lot of the type of reporting I do is sort of accountability style reporting. So we look for the bad actors a lot of times or zoos that are having problems like, you know, in Mosul or in Yemen. And our readers really want to know how do these types of situations happen and what can they do to fix it? Well, I think that's a great perspective. We recently had a case here in Metro Detroit that went national, and it was ridiculous the way it was presented because the real welfare of this animal, I think, was largely ignored in the theatrics of what this story ended up looking like. But there was a kangaroo that was uh, being paraded around by a man uh, in the Detroit area who essentially says he runs a mini zoo, which I think in many ways, uh, and I will take my uh, objectivity away for the purpose of this morning in this discussion and say that it was absolutely absurd that this person thought he was running a zoo out of his home, but he had all these wildlife animals, and one of them was a kangaroo, and a big uh, rapper, uh, entertainer, was in town, and someone said, hey, you should hook up with that guy and get the kangaroo on stage. And so there's this viral video of how this kangaroo was being paraded around stage. I mean, honestly, it was heartbreaking to watch. Uh, and so that dialogue, then a bad actor, was on the news. But then the big question is, well, what do you do with that? How many more of these types of bad actors are there? So we'll talk to you more, more about that um, as we continue this morning. Uh, Karin, you're, of course, with uh, the Washington Post. And, you know, it's interesting perspective. The National Geographic, that is their sole, one of their sole uh, topics that they would be covering is the welfare of animals. At the Washington Post, you cover a broad array of topics. How do you then broach the topics of zoos and aquariums, and, and where do you cover those stories? Um, so, is this on? Uh, uh, I'm really lucky to have the job I have, and I think the job I have now is reflective of, of a lot of what has been talked about in the past couple of years. Um, just for a little background, I've been at the Post for 14 years. I've had lots of different jobs, and I think at the start of my career, um, I would have said that my two fantasy jobs were to be a foreign correspondent and to be an animal reporter. The first of which was like a job that existed and the second one is a job that would have been laughed at at the time. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have gotten to do both. Um, so the job I have now, I, I suggest, I, I pitched it as we say, um, about two years ago uh, to, to start a beat about animals and the way people relate to animals and people's changing attitudes and changing thinking about animals. Um, so, so that's what I do now full time. Um, and part of that, of course, involves zoos, but I also cover things like, um, I mean, I cover things from pets to, you know, developments in uh, animal cognition and behavior to legal issues um, involving animals um, to wildlife issues too, um, which has, you know, I've had the pleasure of talking to probably interviewing 10 or 15 of you in this room, and so it's been really cool to, to be able to meet you in person. Um, anyway, so zoos are something that, you know, fall into that category sometimes. Um, they haven't a ton yet, but I think, to me, the most relevant part, again, is that what I'm interested in, especially, is, is how people's thinking about animals has changed. And I think you all clearly sense, and we can tell from the conversations that have been had here, um, that you know, the way people think about zoos is changing, too, and, and aquariums and animals in captivity in general. Um, so, so that's probably where my interest lies most. And Lucy, you, as we continue to kind of introduce all of our panelists with your own words, when you take a look at what you were doing here in Detroit, of course, very uh, tied in with a lot of the coverage here at the Detroit Zoo, you moved to Philadelphia. That love didn't leave. It probably continues uh, pretty strongly over there. So how do you 
Uh, how do you pitch stories in your newsroom, and how do you kind of stay connected to zoo stories and aquarium stories? All right, so, you know, you have the national and international front here because you guys both do that. I'm, I'm more of the boots on the ground with the local folk, right? So I actually have traveled a lot. After Detroit, I went to New York City, Houston, Los Angeles. Um, in L.A., I had the opportunity at NBC. I anchored and, and uh, reported there uh, of working on a lot of the, the animal stories. It was much easier to pitch them there. Now, they weren't necessarily zoo stories, though. I I'll tell you, for the longest time, um, I would avoid zoos. Why? Because I think, like a lot of people um, that I have talked to, because I, I did a small Rorschach test with some of the folks, and I'll explain that to you in a little bit, but um, I had mixed feelings you know, about zoos, and, and I did for the longest time. So in L.A., I did a lot of the, the maritime stuff, whether it's uh, ship strikes and maritime nautical lanes going through marine uh, national sanctuaries or um, wildlife corridors because of genetic diversity and issues with mountain lions that are already showing things like kinks in their tails and such and the need for wildlife corridors. Um, so it wasn't necessarily zoos per se. And I, I will tell you that all the zoo stories I've ever covered, uh, in, save for here in Detroit, whether it's New York City, Houston, um, L.A., or now Philadelphia, they're always, oh, look at the new baby that's born. Let's have a naming contest. Sure. Um, seriously, that's, that's what we do. Or, oh, the aquarium has a new penguin that just got hatched. Isn't that cute? That's, that's, that's it. That's, it goes no further than that. There is no depth. And that's a problem, if you ask me, which is why the prevailing stereotypes still continue. So the question, I think, for the zoos and aquariums and, the, and all of you folks who run them is how do we break through that? So, I mean, let, let me just tell you, I, I wrote down a couple of things, and I'm not going to bore you with 12 pages of notes, but just very quickly, I, I did do that small little test because I knew I was coming here. And I, I asked people, and I have a small platform, and I'm sorry about my voice, but I asked people, I said, I'm going to throw out a few words, give me gut level reaction, then think about it, mull it over a little bit, and expand upon your answer. So the words that I threw out were zoo, aquariums, animal welfare. Give me your reactions. So um, basically, uh, the really what f by far and away summed it up was a lady named uh, Jamie Bartram Cipher who said this, I love hate feelings on it. Quote, that was it. It was very succinct, that was it. Now, so many of them did write that they love animals, they love seeing the animals, they love zoos and aquariums, they let them do so, but at the expense of what to the animals? So, now regarding messaging and how we cover zoos, I hate saying this because it's not an accredited institution, it's a roadside place, April the giraffe. Mm -hmm. Night, not, not, the late night talk shows sure. were talking about this. GMA Today, it was everywhere, right? So here, and, and, and here's the problem that I think that you face, is that this is a comment from a lady named Mary Walter to me. Um, and this is what she said verbatim. Enclosures should not be enclosures. Have animals in natural habitats, even if it means having fewer animals. More interactive, like April the giraffe. So I wrote her back. I said, let me tell you a small story about April. And I, I tried to expand upon that a little bit. But the, the, I, I think, how do we cover it? We need to cover it better. How do we cover it better? By messaging it better. How do we message it better? By you guys reaching out to us and showing us what you do. I, I love that. And the relationships that all reporters build with, with organizations that you are a part of are, is huge. I mean, that is a huge part of the dialogue. You know, if I didn't know Ron and his team here, if they weren't constantly plugged in, when I get an email from one of them, I open it right away. And I look at what the discussion is going to be about. And it's not about the latest baby that's born, but it's rather about conservation efforts, preservation efforts, and efforts to make the world better for animals. And that starts right here at home. Um, and so when we take a look at that across the board, at the National Geographic, for instance, I know um, you guys have to be taking a very close look at the difference between something like April the Giraffe and real preservation efforts that are happening. How do you discern that, and how do you cover that? Um, just to say something on the messaging really quick, because I think this is something we can't hammer home too hard for you guys, is um, it's really hard for us to get a hold of people at zoos. The levels if it's not about of, baby animals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The levels of bureaucracy and number of communications people we have to go through to get to you guys makes it a real challenge for us to hear about the good work that you're doing. So if you guys are doing something cool on the animal welfare or conservation front, just email us, let us know directly. But it, I mean, and this is true for, you know, almost anything we report on. It can be so hard in big organizations to get through to the people who are doing the actual work. 
And that's a that's a really big roadblock for us in you know talking about Rachel, what you guys would you do. <laughs> specify just so maybe it would help some of the folks who are in this room right now. What exactly do you run into? So, for instance, if you want to do a story, you have an idea, you reach out to the communications person, and well, then what happens? Uh, I don't hear back for a while, and then I reach out again and don't hear back for a while, and that goes for a little while. And eventually, you know, through Googling, I may find one of your direct email addresses, and then when I reach out directly, I hear, oh, you guys have to go through our communications office. And then it's back to the beginning. So if you want us to cover the work that you're doing, we need you know, a little bit more back and forth. And the same is true for when I'm doing um, stories, for example. You know, like I said, a lot of the stories that I do are about bad actors. They're not from accredited zoos that are trying to do good things like you guys are, but they're from roadside zoos or they're from you know, zoos in developing countries. But I have also written about a couple of Waza zoos and that you know, are not following good animal welfare practices. And then when I try to either reach out to that zoo or to experts or even to Waza, and now maybe it'll be different under the, you know, now that it's under new leadership, but the responses we get are almost um, either defensive or very, you know, PR flat. And our readers have such good BS detectors, they, they know that, you yeah. know, you're avoiding the issue. And it could be, you know, readers want to like zoos. We all grew up going to zoos, and that helped, I think, develop our love for animals. But um, they want to see and hear zoos taking a stand to support good animal welfare. And doing things like when there is a bad actor who's highlighted, you know, even if it's not part of the AZA or your accreditation, people obviously, I'm sure you run into this, are still going to hold the AZA responsible. <laughs> um, and they want to hear these membership associations taking a stand. And that can go so far in generating goodwill. I got to tell you, when we had that case of that kangaroo being pranced around a stage and essentially abused and mishandled on stage, uh, we happened to be at the zoo the day after that story broke, and we were talking about other issues and about some new things here at the zoo. And I looked at Ron, and I said, would you mind if we grab a soundbite with you? And we grabbed a soundbite with him. We fed it back to the station. I said, use this in your show at some point. I actually called the producer up who was in charge of the next hour and said, make room. Put this in. It's important. I'll write it. And so I wrote the, the story in my phone and emailed it to him. You don't have to do any work. Here's a soundbite. The next day, the story even developed more, and we came back and interviewed Ron. I think you're so right to be able to say there should be that instant access, and I get that a lot of you guys are afraid of being burned. And there are bad actors not only in the animal world but in the media world as well, but most of them are not bad actors. Most of them are trying, right, Karen? Would you yes. say? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, yes, what you um, say? We want to I, tell I just good would stories. Like, <laughs> I would just add to that that, you know, so I don't write... Um, I don't consider myself, I write a blog that's all about animals, but I don't consider it an animal activism blog or an animal advocacy blog or even an animal welfare blog. Those are certainly topics I cover, but I'm, I don't consider myself on a, a side one way or the other. Um, although, I mean, obviously I'm not on the side of people who, you know, kill animals um, <laughs> for doing it in terrible ways. Um, but, uh, but I, similarly, I think that, um, you know, there there is often, a, it feels like a, it's a defensive posture from, from zoos. Um, so I, I do get a lot of story pitches from zoos that are often like the latest baby animal. And those stories get covered, at, you know, um, people love them. You know, I was talking to somebody about Fiona, the the hippo, who is adorable, um, but, but is not the kind of thing I cover. Um, on the other hand, when there are terrible, you know, terrible and, and surely unusual things that happen at zoos like Harambe or, you know, this um, this incident at the French Zoo a few months ago where the rhino was you know, poached at the zoo. Um, those are cases I feel like, you know, that I've wanted access to people at zoos who could be thoughtful about what are clearly complicated issues. I mean, how fascinating would it have been to be able to talk to somebody at the Cincinnati Zoo, to talk to the people who were in, involved in the decision-making process to shoot her up, you know, to, to kill Harambe. I mean, and I, I would come at that as an, you know, with 
open questions about how, how do you make a decision like that? Can you explain to us, can you take us behind the scenes to explain to us how these things happen? And, and often, and I do understand that's a terrible sort of PR situation for zoos, but often the response is just, you know, shut, complete shutdown. Um, so I, again, having heard some of the conversations in the past couple of days here, you all are grappling with a lot of, you know, there are complicated issues about zoos. Um, and I would, it, it's really helpful to hear you know, people hear the grappling and hear the thought process and, and talk, talk about that. And if I may just say, just from a, a local news perspective here in Detroit, um, I understand the issue of avoiding bad PR when something terrible happens in your organization. But, you know, there's going to be bad PR because it happened already. The question is, do you want to lift the curtain and let us peek in and understand what the decision-making process was like, or would you rather us cover it from the outside? Because no matter what, if you don't talk, there's always still going to be a story, but guess who gets the microphone? It's going to be somebody who's an expert in the field, right, outside of you. Well, this is true, but here's another thing. I mean, why wait for a tragedy to talk? True. Why don't you be the newsbreaker? Why do you, you know, don't, don't let something like Harambe or whatever else happen, and then suddenly you're talking for the first sure. time. My thing would be, why don't you reach out in your cities, wherever you are, um, whether it's, you know, in Africa or in Europe or around here, with what cool thing you're doing aside from the baby hippo being born. I mean, that's awesome. But that should be the icing on the cake. You need much more substance to be able to reach out to your community and say, we're important. This is why we're important. You may think that we just house animals for the sake and entertainment of people, which I think makes a lot of people go, eh. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell them what you're doing? Why don't you tell them the conservation work you're doing? Why don't you tell them the partnerships you're doing? And, and, and reach out that way. And, and you know how you're saying it's, it's hard to reach out to them. And it, it is. But here's the thing. What you need to do is establish relationships with those of us in the media. Yourself. Find somebody you trust. Talk to them. Bring them out to lunch. Um, form a relationship. That's what Ron and I did. I mean, it is. And, and so, therefore, I heard him, and I understood what he was doing. And, and when I had questions about, well, why do you have this enclosure like that, he could explain it to me. And then I went, oh, well, that makes sense, Before, instead of just making an instant snap judgment. So that if something were bad to happen at your zoo, you've already had this relationship now established with people within your community, within the media, that you talk to about cool, groundbreaking stuff that you are working on. I mean, I would get ahead of the, the, you know, the news cycle. And I think that's a great idea. Those relationships are really invaluable. And by the way, when you build a relationship with somebody, uh, you're less likely to ever be burned by that organization for any given reason, even if you don't get back in time. Maybe there's more of an effort that we'd make because we have your cell phone. So we'd be able to say, look, I, I called uh, so-and-so and I didn't hear back. I'd like to be able to talk about this. We're on at, in three hours. Make this work for us. Um, would you say, uh, w when it comes to one of the questions, I think Lucy helped answer just now, is what is the best way to increase news coverage? Uh, those relationship building uh, skills are critical. Uh, what else is important? I think another thing is, even if you don't necessarily have a story that you want us to write about, by developing the relationships like Lucy was talking about, then when something happens at another zoo, or when we have a story about a roadside zoo, or you know exotic pets, we know you're there, we know your expertise, and we can call on you to comment on the story as an expert. So, you know, it's not even necessarily about the work that you're doing, but you're still position you're still able to position yourself as as an authority on the issue. And that's I mean, we're always looking for people who can, you know, comment in that kind of capacity. Karen, if you could uh, this is one of the questions, if you could offer the zoo aquarium uh, one piece of advice regarding our communications regarding animal welfare, what would it be? So if you could offer any zoo and aquarium leader a piece of advice regarding, again, their communication regarding animal welfare, what would it be? What's the one thing that's missing? What's the missing piece, the missing link, the thing you wish you I had? guess I'd go back to, to what I just said, which is that sort of the more behind the scenes access you can offer, at least for me, and I, I don't know, uh, you know, it depends on the, the kind of media you're working with. Um, but the more you can sort of take us inside how things happen and, and introduce us to the keepers and all these people who sort of make, make what happens at the zoo every day happen, um, I feel like that, that would be sort of far more informative than there's a new baby. Lucy, what happens when you have the giraffe video that goes viral and you have, I don't know, at one given time, 17 million people who viewed the video or whatever it is. 
How then do we go back to our news managers and say, as advocates for animals and for report, as reporters who love animals, to be able to say, yeah, that Zeus, that, that giraffe stuff isn't exactly it. We need to go and do A, B, and C instead when that's getting all those hits. The good thing about something that goes viral like that is it shows that people love kids and animals, right? That's what always goes viral. Um, so that's, it's a real easy sell. I mean, the bottom line for us in the media, sadly, is money. That's it. So more people watch, better circulation, that's it. So that's what we, you know, that's, I mean, unabashedly, I think maybe more from my end than these two because you work for wonderful state organizations. I work for a local Fox station. So, but I mean, the thing is, though, so you can replicate me a thousand times over, I mean, around the world, and those are your local TV stations. So how do you, I mean, for me, it's easy because I kind of um, am able to run my newsroom. I mean, I'm, I'm a news manager. I get to dictate some things in the evening, so I'm an aberration when it comes to that. So, and, and I think, though, ratings prove out that people do care. Mm -hmm. And so, like for me, I would ad lib, oh, April the Giraffe, she's so cute, isn't she cute? But, you know, there's some issues with that. And I'll throw that out there and say you might want to check it out. And I'll do that. So it's, I don't know that other people have the license to, you know. So. Well, and I think we've got to figure out who those leaders are who do have the licenses and maybe reach yeah. out to them and form relationships with them. And you're looking at three of them on stage right now who certainly do have uh, that license to be able to have that conversation on the air or in a publication. Uh, somebody else asking the question, do you think we are too risk averse to tell our stories? And I know we touched on this, but beyond the frustration of what that feels like to you when somebody who is risk averse is acting out, so to speak, by either not responding or by responding with uh, guarded messaging, um, they're asking, do you think we are too risk averse? I think we've answered that by saying yes, but what is it about that that we can try to begin to change today? People don't understand what you do. I mean, for me, I, I don't, I mean, I, I truly think, I, don't, I think that at least the, I'm talking to average Joes, not necessarily National Geographic readers, of which I've subscribed to since I was a tiny kid. So, but I think the average Joe, which is involved in paying the rent, getting the kid off to school, going through their social media feeds, you got to break through the white noise and tell them what you do. I think they think that you go to the zoo, you have your Dippin' Dots, you go, you, I like Dippin' Dots, you go through and you go through and you see a few of the animals, you take the train ride around, you go home. They don't, they don't think beyond that. And I think you need to just break through the white noise. And, and sometimes it's being catchy, but being catchy can change opinions. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I truly do. I think you got to break through it. How do you make preservation and conservation as sexy as a viral video? And, and not to say you can, but the bottom line is... You personalize is, it. You personalize it. But I think there's the one thing you do is when something like that giraffe story comes up, I love what Lucy said about that, you find that as your way of starting another conversation. Yes. Because you have that opportunity. There's this huge wildfire on social media. It's like, wow, why don't we put our wick in that and burn another fire over here and <laughs> keep, keep lighting all these candles? Would you say that's a good way? Karen? Uh, is, what's a good way? I can't, sorry. Well, you're just taking a look at when you have a big story that is that you probably, as an animal reporter and someone who concentrates, you probably roll your eyes and go, oh, my God, another you know, cute baby story. This isn't what it's all about. There's more to this. How do you then take that cute baby story and turn it into more than that? So I, I guess my answer might not be really helpful to zoo, zoo leaders. Um, the April story to me was was actually very interesting from like a sociological standpoint, right? Like the, that you have that there are so many people who are obsessed with watching this giraffe who's pregnant. Um, so to me, that would be more an opportunity to like write about the people, uh, who the viewers, and sort of why they're why they're obsessed with this, to the extent that can be answered. Um, uh, so I'm not sure that that's. That's an answer that's helpful to people in zoos, but but I guess I would say that you know when it comes to you were talking about be, being an expert um, for commenting on things like this, you know one thing I've heard over the past couple of days a lot is just this distinction between roadside zoos and accredited zoos, um, and the ex you know if that if that's something and I do think the lines are extremely blurred for the average person. I mean I don't think the average person knows what AZA is or oh. cares at all. Um, and if that's important to you to to distinguish, um, and and even if it means 
I don't know, risk, I, I don't know if the AZA has come out strongly enough in sort of trying to distinguish itself, each, you know, from, from other zoos, but, um, but that would be a good way, good way to do it. All right, let's talk to, uh, to Rachel a little bit about this one. When this person's asking, when multiple journalists contact a zoo about a story, um, how do you best verify the good journalists? And I know you're a journalist, so it's, but it, you, you'd have an interesting perspective. And what are the benefits and the costs of making one public statement versus individual responses? We hate quoting from press releases. <laughs> press releases are good for informing us about what's going on, but any good reporter is going to call you up and ask for more information and ask for a unique quote. So putting out a single statement for most of us who like to be thorough with our jobs isn't going to be enough. Um, as far as you know, verifying who's a good journalist, obviously you know the fake news thing is a big concern for people now. But I would say do the same thing that we do when we're looking for experts to comment. We just start Googling. We'll, you know, if I email you put my name into Google, see what kinds of stories I've written, and, you know, I guess you have to have some level of news literacy to be able to decide, but I'm sure most of you do, you know, look at our stories. Do we quote people from, do we quote a wide range of people who represent different viewpoints? Do we make an effort to go beyond whatever press release we received and get additional information? Um, do we, um, you know, simplify things enough that our readers can understand them, but not so much that we're losing the nuances? You just have to look at our body of work and make the decision whether or not you're going to trust us. And if you're not sure, give us a call and we will talk to you. We will tell you why you should talk to us. And we are happy to, you know, discuss more about what's on the record, what information we'll take on background, um, you know, all that kinds of stuff. It goes back to forming that relationship. Karen, a little bit about that yourself. Uh, the benefits and costs of making one public statement, obviously, than the individual interviews that you do with somebody. And how do you best verify the good actors and the bad actors in the media world? I think Rachel just summed it up <laughs> pretty much. I don't have much to add to that. I mean, you know, I understand, like, there are time constraints. If, you're, if, you're, if there's a story and you're getting 400 media calls, you know, like you're not going to speak to 400 people, so statements make sense for, from an efficiency point of view. Um, but but also in that situation, that's when it's probably helpful to know if there's a couple of people out there who it's worth picking up the phone and actually like talking to in, in you know greater depth. Um, pick up pick up on this one then. If there's a controversy, how do you tell the difference between a single loud voice representing a majority versus a zoo professional representing multiple accredited zoos and their positions? So basically you have like a person who you're interviewing and they're saying, look, on behalf of so, such and such zoo organization, we're speaking. But in this case, this person who's a zoo professional is saying, if there is an issue, a controversy, kind of like uh, you talked about earlier, mm -hmm. how do you differentiate be uh, between a single loud voice representing a majority versus a zoo professional representing multiple accredited zoos and their positions? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Is the single loud voice in this question a, a zoo person? I think the person who's asking this question, I, I don't know who asked the question, but I have the card in front of me, but I can tell that it's obviously someone who's a zoo, a zoo professional. Oh, yeah. But who's the loud voice? Yeah. Is, is, is the loud voice like an animal advocacy group that's out there going, ah, or is... Who, who I think we? that's what okay. they're asking. I think they're All saying right. the single loud voice representing a majority would be the, the loud community. Representing a minority. Ah. Uh. Okay. <laughs> I think you wrote the question. You wrote, you wrote majority <laughs> and you meant minority. Got it. So how... <laughs> Here we go again in three, two, one. If there's a controversy, how do you differentiate between a single loud voice representing a minority versus a zoo professional representing multiple accredited zoos? Uh, okay, I'm trying to think of a scenario. So, so something bad happens at a zoo and you have like a small advocacy organization saying yep. this is a terrible thing and you have the AZA, which represents a lot of organizations saying, well, here's what we think. Um, how do I personally distinguish, or how does the, the public? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, I think in that case, you know, we'd probably, it just depends on how, it's very hard to answer that. I guess it would be case by case. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I don't know. I no, don't have a great I understand. answer for that. And it is an individual, individualized thing. You'd have to look at that particular story, the dynamics involved. I mean, I think we all have a sense of advocacy groups, um, you know, value or, or importance too, right? Like in how, I mean, hopefully the more you report on these topics, the more you understand whether like some tiny group is saying something that's totally off the wall and unrepresentative or, you know, it's representative of something larger. And so, you know, I think we have to judge those every time. Well, uh, Rachel, let's uh, ask you this. What are the best zoos doing differently and how do you see uh, as the future of zoos? What do you see as the future of zoos? So what are the best ones doing the best ways? What are the practices that other zoos, uh, when you watch, could probably emulate and do a good job at? Um, I guess this depends if we're talking from like a PR perspective in terms of communicating with us or? Yeah. Okay. Um, a good zoo would make makes themselves and their experts available to us even when they don't necessarily have a story they're trying to sell us. I think that's the bottom line. Um, yeah, I think I think that's pretty that's much good. it. Karen, what would you say? Um, I guess this is more sort of about thinking about communications and for the communications people, but also for, for leaders and zoos, um, which is, I, I would love to, so so yes, the extent to which you can be proactive and sort of come to us with, with stories that are not baby animals um, is great, but, uh, but it would also be good to think about, you know, what are you doing that's like surprising and really different and that you've never read about anywhere else um, or read about other zoos doing or that really you feel like stands out or, or is something that, that you think the public doesn't know about and would be surprised by. Um, I think those are the kind of things that I would be most interested in hearing about. Lucy, uh, someone's asking specifically about television. Uh, you alluded to how more coverage of thoughtful pieces can be done beyond the baby animal. And a lot of that would mean you taking licensure to be able to speak a little bit more about it while you're ad-libbing or you're talking. But in terms of getting a crew out there and really saying, okay, let's dedicate time on the newscast. It's more than 45 seconds to something that is about preservation. Um, what would you say? How, would you, how, do, how do they go, go about beginning that process? Again, it's, it's, it's about establishing the relationship with the individuals within the communities with, with which you work. Um, if it's a na I mean, it, it can be national or international. These things can be picked up everywhere, to be honest, especially in this day and age of social media, right? So I do a story. It goes on my air. I put it on my Facebook page, and I've got, you know, what, 30,000 people that might love it, and they share it, and then it's around the world, and that's how it goes. Um, really, honestly, I think that people want to love zoos and aquariums. There's something wonderful about being transported to far off and exotic lands at your place. You can go and see things that you could probably never go to. Most people can't afford to go on an African safari. They can't afford to go off to the jungles of Asia. They can't afford to go down an Amazon river, but they can afford to come see you if they save up, sometimes a little expensive. But you know, they can, they can come see you. Um, and they want to see you and, they, and they, they, they want a full immersive experience. And I think so many of you are doing that amazing thing now. But, I mean, we can all get better, right? I mean, it's, we, it's an evolutionary process all the way through. But I think that you just need to better tell what you're doing to the people um, that are too busy and bogged down with their everyday lives. And that's, again, establishing the relationship and saying, like a who from Whoville, I am here, I am here, I am here. And, 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 and really saying that and saying, this is what we do. We're not just housing animals for your entertainment. That was so last, you know, century or last decade or whatever it is, we do this now. I mean, one of the things that I covered that really started this whole thing was um, the elephants here in Detroit. Okay, so I was here then when this happened. And they're beloved. They're a big money maker, right? Big money maker. So that's good in a strap cash city like Detroit. And they're beloved. People love their elephants. But some one person, you know, Ron Kagan, stood up and said, this isn't right for all of these reasons. And he spelled it out quite eloquently on our show. Mm -hmm. And our show, again, reaches that wide audience. It doesn't just love one thing, but loves a broad thing. So they're talking about the Detroit Lions, and we're talking about, you know, the Pistons doing this and that, and the bad boys, and yada, da, da, da. And guess what? We're getting rid of our elephants. What? You'd think there'd be a hue and cry. There was a hue and cry, but it wasn't through 
the average Joe. It was the zoo officials. It was the AZA. It, it was that was the hue and cry. It wasn't from the average Joe because Ron's message was on point. It was succinct. It was eloquent, and it made people go, "Oh." We didn't know that was a bad thing. Now we know it's a bad thing. Well, let's save the elephants. And so we saved the elephants. And Ron, I think, paid for it a little bit, which was unfortunate. But eventually, everybody came around and started seeing that. But that was, you know, I mean, who would have thought that people in Detroit would have cared about some elephants? And I mean, they would have cared about them, but they didn't know it was a bad thing, keeping them in a northern climate in their tiny little box all winter long. They didn't, they didn't know that. Well, they did know that because he messaged it right on the media that just everybody, you know, watched, and it worked, and people cared, and it's all good now. I mean, and that can happen over and over again. If you find yourself in a tough situation, you've got to craft your message in a way to show people in, in really small words. Jane yeah. caught the ball, and sure. it was good, right? And, you, you, and, that, sure. and the, seriously, you, that's, you don't have to do that so much for print. I know, <laughs> I know, but they're lofty. Plus, if you lose her because she has a run-on sentence, you can go back and read it again. But... Um, not that you would. Okay. But, but <laughs> she doesn't. <Yeah. laughs> Never. But but for for my audience, we we all have we, we all have attention deficit issues because you're watching the TV and and then oh I got the thing somebody just what you know somebody just messaged sure. me and you're gone so you got to be succinct and you got to say it again and again and again. And and repetition is key. Uh, you know yeah. I I would say my my wife is a mental health therapist and a lot of times um, some of the stories that that we will end up thinking about doing, I, I get from her because she has a totally different perspective. She actually suggested recently, and Ron, we can talk about this, um, when people get really, really stressed out, what are the things you can do? Where can you go? People like to escape. They want to go to the movies. They want to go to here. They want to go there. And I remember after 9-11, I was uh, an anchor in Flint um, years ago, and the one thing that we did is we went and we told stories about how pe more people were going to the movies than ever before. They hadn't seen that kind of a rush in, I think, the, in the five years previous to 9-11. Movie theaters were seeing an incredible resurgence, and the reason is because people wanted to and needed to escape. But if, from a mental health point of view, I remember all these soccer moms are saying, your audience, you know, I'm so busy, I never get time, I can't catch my breath. And maybe this is the one story that we could do where you can actually say, yeah, we'll talk about conservation, but in the context of, ah, what a relaxing place to come to. So there's other stories there. Uh, we have about five minutes left, so I want to open it up for our panel to basically talk about something that they would really like to message out to the messengers who are here. So we'll begin right now with uh, Rachel. Uh, talk, if you would, a little bit about uh, the things that you see from your perspective. So I think the title of this panel was uh, The Public's Perception of Animal Welfare in Zoos. And there was one thing... Um, Obviously, you know, we all work for very different audiences, and National Geographic's audience tends to be fairly in tune with animal welfare issues. About half of our audience is like, why are you writing about animal welfare when people are dying? Which I'm sure is something that uh, you guys have heard before. And the others are like, yeah, animal welfare, we need more of these stories. But... Um, one thing that we have found that our readers really like is the stories of individual animals. You know, a rescue story is gold. Or the story of, um, you know, we've talked about April the giraffe, obviously. But somebody yesterday, I think I had heard mentioned that some zoos are now trying a thing where rather than their messaging um, at an enclosure being about like a species in general, you tell the story of that individual animal. And I can tell you at least that's something that the National Geographic audience would respond to completely. That's the way we've found, um, like Lucy was saying, to get readers really interested in the broader issues. So it's like you sort of start with the dessert, you give them the candy, something like pretty and exciting, but then you can sort of like slip the vegetables in too. And that works really well with our readers. The other thing I wanted to mention real quick is um, I wanted to comment on something I think one of the directors said yesterday at the panel, which was, um, well, I had noticed when some of the NGO folks were up here talking about things that zoos could do to improve their image as, you know, a bastion of conservation and a champion of animal welfare, I heard people around me in the audience saying, well, we're already doing that, we're already doing that, why don't they know about that? And I think it's so important, as one of the directors said yesterday, 
that if people are complaining that you're not doing something, you can't get mad at them if you are. It means there's some disconnect in the level of communication. Because I know, you know, you guys are all here. Everybody obviously cares about animal welfare. And this is a really good opportunity for the zoo leaders to work with the media in telling these kinds of success stories. Um, if, you know, you're immersed in it every day, so it seems like, you know, of course it's something we're doing. But to be honest, like, our public sees zoos as a place to go and look at animals. It's most people do not know about all the other work zoos are doing, so help us tell that story. Karen? Um, yes, all those things. Um, although <laughs> I, um, I personally don't pitch... Well, I, I'm interested in individual animal stories to the extent that they're extremely unique, so just keep that in mind if you want to send me pitches. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, too, surveyed sort of like my very small... Well, I, I have a newsletter that goes out once a week, and so I asked people in my newsletter what they think of welfare at zoos, because that was the topic of this. Um, and that's a totally unscientific sample. Um, it starts, of course, with people who subscribe to a newsletter about animals. And yet I think these are also people who come at that from a really, from very different places. I mean, there are people who subscribe who are like, I love animals, and then there are animal welfare activist type of people too. Um, and I, I was in some ways surprised, I guess, to, to see that it, responses really came in kind of like completely divided. I got a lot of people saying they're crucial for conservation, they're crucial places for showing, you know, teaching children about, you know, animals. Um, and then a lot of people saying things I'm sure you've heard, which is I don't like seeing animals in enclosures, period. Um, you know, predators can't predate, and that's wrong. Um, and then a lot of kind of in the middle ambivalent feelings, too, like both of those things combined. Um, so, so that's just sort of the, the backdrop there. Um, we hear that a lot with elephants and gorillas, especially. <laughs> Yeah, which is interesting, right? Like, you know, there's certainly, you all have seen, there's certainly shifts in the way you view the captivity of animals like that. And so, you know, pe people have caught on to that. Um, and so I guess, so my advice, you know, in some of this we've already touched on, but is like, for, for me, being open about the complexity of a lot of what you do would be really helpful. Don't just talk about fluffy things, but talk about difficult decisions and, and how you make them. Um, that stuff's fascinating. Show show us behind the scenes to the extent you can. That would be great. Um, I think another thing that you know, listening to a lot of the panels, um, and everybody gets immersed in their own their own worlds, right? And and they start to become normal. Um, but I think you know, at zoos, probably there needs to be a recognition that a lot of what you do sounds a bit can sound a bit science fictiony, <laughs> where you have like you know you have these living beings that are you know enclosed and you decide when they eat and you decide when they mate and if they mate and that can all come off as um, sounding maybe strange to a lot of people so um, I guess I would just keep that in mind as you talk about your work um, and then you know as Rachel said I think just making a lot clearer what you're doing for conservation um, would be would be helpful thank you Karen Lucy Pretty much said it all. I mean, as far as, as what I think, I mean, you just gotta you gotta craft your message and get it out there. I mean, do you do you have any? You've heard us up here blabbering on. Do you have any questions? I mean, do you have a question? Does anybody have one that you want to throw out that we haven't touched on? Is, I mean, you can yell from there. We can hear you. We completely answered everything that well, you've ever wondered. Well, we answered wondered. a lot of the questions <laughs> that they had uh, okay. written down and given to us. I, I I'll just say one thing. Uh, that makes it a lot easier. If you want to know, as, as a morning anchor and as someone who helps also determine where we're going to go in the morning after I'm done anchoring for an hour and a half, I go report the news, and I help with my executive producer decide where I'm going to be live. And one of the things I'll do is I'll pick up all these press releases from all these different organizations, and the first question that comes up with all of the producers is, well, who are you going to talk to, what's going to be available to see, and how soon can they do it? So if you think about that for a quick moment, when you're putting your press release together, if there's a way for you to actually highlight and say, um, we'll have these things available, these elements of a story, you'll see uh, the actual animals. You'll, you'll have Ron Kagan live at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, so when I can come out and say, we'll have these people available, these principles available, these video elements available, the producer's like, sold, go. So you're basically saying to everyone here, make it easy? 
Make it easy. All right. But no, but I think a lot of times we put out press releases and then we just say, well, these are the ideas, right? But a lot of times, believe it or not, that seems pie in the sky to the producer who's sitting there or the editor who's sitting there because it's like, well, what is this going to look like on paper or on television? And so maybe that would be a good thing. Yeah, and and similarly, um, the reason we turn down a lot of stories is that there's no really news hook. So you're saying like, you know, this thing is happening. We've been working on this for a couple of years. It's great. Go us. And we may look at it and say, yeah, that's really nice, but why are we telling this story now? So you need to give us something when you're, contact- when you're contacting us is, is um, why should you write this story this week? Or why are you contacting us at this moment? Why do readers need to know about it right now and not in, you know, six months? What's the now hook right now? Rachel Bale, reporter with National Geographic, Karen Brilliard, staff writer and editor of the Washington Post, and of course Lucy Nolan with Fox 29 in Philadelphia. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us on this panel. Thank you. It's been fun to be with you, and I'm sure they'll be willing to answer more questions. I know I will as well, but it's good to meet you. I wish I could meet you all because I'm, I'm actually fascinated by what you do, uh, and I get to talk to Ron and his crew all the time, but if I get a chance to say hi to you guys, I'd love to, so... Ron's the most boring fellow here. Ron's the most boring fellow here? Come on. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>